This is Pete Moore on Halo Talks NYC. I have the pleasure of bringing Laura Edelson from Tangerine Yoga by way of Jamie, by way of Eric Kanner, by way of myself to find out how she is doing with her concept, growing it into a profitable business and the potential of what yoga has to serve more people on feeling better, living a better lifestyle and getting flexible. So Laura, welcome to the show. Thank you, Pete. So first off, we got Tangerine. So talk about the name and uh, how that came about and what you think the brand represents. Uh, yeah. So for a little bit of background, I am not the founder of Tangerine Yoga. Um, we took over ownership during the pandemic, um, but okay. I do know how the name came about from the founder. Um, the idea is that a tangerine is slightly sweeter and slightly stronger than an orange. Um, so we use that tagline often slightly sweeter, slightly stronger. Um, and we like to infuse that into our, our brand identity and practice. Um, for us, it's, it's a playful practice. It's a fun practice. Of course, there are serious elements of yoga, um, but we want people to have a good time and have fun with it too. So what prompted you to get into the industry uh, with so much uncertainty uh, around that? Um, yeah, I really credit my husband and business partner for that. I used to work at the studio. And so as a staff member, I found out that it was going to go out of business. And I just was sad. And I was telling my husband how sad I was about it because it was the only place that I'd really experienced community in a yoga studio. And the teachers were so experienced and senior, and I really learned a lot from them. So I was really upset if the studio was going to go away. Um, and so it was my husband's idea. He's um, less risk averse than I am that we take okay. over the studio. Got it. You know, it's interesting because we're trying to get studio owners who anticipate that they are going to close to have conversations with their instructors, with their members, with the landlord, anybody who's a stakeholder uh, in that operation because they typically think that they want to keep it quiet. Uh, in order to potentially sell memberships or classes in that interim period. Um, so we've actually got a checklist of here's what you want to do 90 days beforehand, not nine days beforehand. So where did you get into, how did you find out, one, uh, when you approached the owner, how did they react? And then tell us, tell us how that evolved, if you can. Uh, yeah. So I got an email as a staff member. They let us know all online classes were going to stop. And it really sounded like there was no chance of reopening. It, it sounded bleak. Um, and that's when I mentioned to my husband that it didn't sound so good. Um, and I knew the founder, the you know, former owner. And so I reached out to her um, and she had an investor who helped her open the studio. Um, the investor had actually been looking to sell before the pandemic started. He moved to Africa with his family. And so he wasn't really um, able to be involved the way he used to be. And so I think part of what helped with the founder is that I was part of the community. I worked there and it was really special to me and something that I really love too. Um, I think it, I would imagine it's always difficult to kind of like give up your baby, so to speak. But I do think it helps if you know that the person who's taking it on, it, then it's it's really important to them too. And without getting too specific, because I'm sure they're confidential opponents of this, but from a assumption of maybe, you know, deferred leases that weren't paid uh, or other liabilities and looking at, you know, what would it cost me to replicate this? Maybe I should just buy the brand and relocate it. Was that a long process? Was that a you know, a reasonable common sense conversation was the founder and the investor saying, this is how much money I put in. This is, I want to get that back, which is obviously not real a rational argument for you as a buyer. Um, so I don't want to get too deep into that, but I think people need to understand that if you are selling and you're at a point where you either sell or you close, try and get to a point where the sale is reasonable and fair to the buyer because you don't want them to go out of business because they overpaid. So maybe you could give us a little couple of bullet points on that. Yeah, I do want to say that the landlord really worked with us and that that made a huge difference. When we were not really? able to be open, there was no rent. Um, oh, that's great. And when we were able to reopen, 
um, at first the rent was proportional to our income. Um, so they really worked with us. We we're on the ground floor of an apartment building and the space that we're in, um, the prior owners, they built it out to be a yoga studio. And so it had never been anything else. It's built to be a yoga studio. Right. Um, they valued having that there on the first floor for their tenants. Um, and they were really willing to work with us. And that made a huge difference. Part of why we wanted to keep that space is that we are conveniently located near almost every single train in, in downtown Brooklyn. We're in a big building. There are tons of huge buildings popping up every day around there. So it's a really busy area. And it was appealing for us to stay there, avoid doing a build out in another new location and be in that really densely populated area. Um, of course, part of what we're paying for is the email list too. You know, that's valuable to have these people who um, have come to the studio before, who are interested in yoga. So there's a certain value, I would say, in the email list itself. Were, were, were there members that were on freeze at the same time that were going to re-up, you know, when it reopens? There were also some very loyal members who had continued to pay, actually, even when the studio... I've heard that closed. story several times where uh, they said, I'll pay, just don't close on me. So that that's a tribute to the, to the location, how they feel about it. And, you know, they're basically providing somewhat of a bridge loan uh, to make sure that they're they have their third place or second. And what we agreed that we would do too is honor the monetary value of any memberships or class packs that couldn't be used because of the pandemic. And so we also felt like we had then people who were more likely to come back, right? Because they already sort of had money on the table and we would honor that when we reopened. Got it. And what kind of messaging did you do, you know, from a personal standpoint? You know, whether that was email, whether that was phone calls, we were working for a large company during the pandemic. Um, and if you took the total number of members that they had divided by the number of employees, um, it was like maybe 200 members to one employee. You could call all those people within a couple of weeks or a week. So how did you use technology and how did you say this is personal? Yeah, I think I was initially a little reluctant to like put myself out there. You know, I felt like it was about the studio. It wasn't about me so much. Um, okay. So I think probably, you know, in retrospect, I might've shared more about me, but like at first I was like, oh, I don't super want my picture on the Instagram or whatever. Um, but of course, when we posted a picture of me and my husband and we're the new owners, people were excited about it. We did, um, you know, we got a lot more consistent with our email marketing during the pandemic. So previously, they were very sporadic about when they emailed, and they didn't really need to be because people were coming into the studio. But, you know, when we were closed, we had to get a lot more consistent about emailing every week, you know, Satan time. So it's a lot more predictable. And we did um, personal reach outs to the email to the, the former members. Um, and at a certain point, too, we kind of asked them, like, why they hadn't come back. And a lot of people had moved, honestly. And that may also be reflective of the area that we're in, downtown Brooklyn. These are a lot of people in apartment buildings. And I think a lot of people, you know, especially if they had young kids, um, left the city during the pandemic. And so we have honestly really had to rebuild our student base, almost like we're opening brand new. I thought we were going to get a lot more returning people. Um, but it's, it's taken a long time. Like every day, I'll meet someone in the studio and they'll say it's my first time back since the pandemic. You know, oh, wow. and it's, it's years now. From a standpoint of the new members that have been coming in, not not the legacy members, are you seeing a, a lower age range? Are you seeing people that are coming in for, they tell you they're coming in for different reasons, um, whether that's I'm very stressed out or, you know, I want to look better or, you know, I've got some, uh, injury that I'm trying to um, uh, to resolve without medication or surgery. Has, has there been anything like you've said, wow, that's interesting that these types of people are coming in for these reasons? So um, a trend that I've seen is that this studio prior to the pandemic, it's a hot yoga studio. Most of the classes are 90 degrees. And I knew some of the members and a lot of them, they wanted a workout. They were like, I want the room hotter. I want to sweat more. They wanted a lot of intensity. And they really, they saw it as a workout. Of course, 
one can debate whether yoga is a workout or not. Um, but since the pandemic, I've seen a lot more focus on um, holistic health and mental health as well. And um, I am a yoga therapist. I have a master's of science in that. And so I started offering a yoga for anxiety class, really not knowing if it would resonate with this community that was previously very workout focused. And it's been a huge success. So I've seen, I think that people are looking to yoga studios, to fitness centers, gyms for not necessarily only their physical health now. So when you take a look at the price points that other studios are at, whether at a, a membership level on a monthly basis or, uh, you know, price per class, where, where's your comfort zone? Um, I always say that people should raise their prices, you know, compared to everything else that you have to buy in New York City or in Brooklyn. You, know, you can't get a turkey wrap for, you know, less than 12 bucks. Yet you get this great yoga experience for, you know, a little bit more than that. So where have you kind of fallen on, you know, comparables of like this class is as, I can say with a straight face, this class is as good as this one and that's what they charge. And I'm going to feel good about that. And if people don't want to pay, you know, maybe that's not the client base. Yoga traditionally has been underpriced uh, in my mind across the country. And that's a lot of that is because yoga instructors who open up their own studio, it was more about, this is my studio. I want to welcome as many people in. And it wasn't as profit driven. So where do you kind of shake out between I'm giving you a great experience? Um, I need to be rewarded for that. And I want to take care of my instructors because they're going to leave at some point if I don't provide them the monetary value. So has that kind of changed or do you feel like we're still kind of teetering on? I don't want to rock the boat, but I also know that there's inflation, there's other opportunities. So if you could give us a little insight on that. Yeah, I would say prior to the pandemic, our studio was priced lower than like some of our comparables. Um, and I think that, I think probably, you know, I, and I can't say for sure, this is simply speculation, is that, you know, they wanted it to be accessible to more people. When we reopened with the pandemic, though, uh, people needed more space. Personal right. space is huge. People do not want to be mat to mat like they used to be. And so in reducing our class capacity, we basically had to increase the price per class or we wouldn't be able to operate. And so I would say that we're priced pretty comparably to our competition now. Perhaps our membership is a little bit lower and we do try and include, we include mats and towels for everyone and, you know, extra towels for unlimited members. That's not typical in a yoga studio model. Usually you are charged extra for a mat, a towel for anything. Um, we do want people to feel like they have everything that they need, that they're being taken care of. Once they pay for the class that they really, you know, they're not going to be nickeled and dimed on top of that. Um, it's going to be all, in, all inclusive. We did also raise how much we pay our instructors and our front desk people. So I did feel like an increase in price was, um, was justified. Um, and yeah, I, I do feel that we are providing a valuable service. Um, I think, of course, it's challenging to compete with, you know, a larger gym, which may have a similar monthly membership price. And, you know, you have showers, you've got a sauna, you've got all kinds of met of amenities. What I think that we provide is um, a lot more community. Um, our students, our members can really know our desk people, all of our teachers. They can get personalized feedback in classes as well. And so I think that's what part of what sets us apart. Gotcha. So when you, when you open up your own uh, business, you, you know, it's like a six month, you know, honeymoon of like, I built this, there's new members coming in, new instructors, getting great feedback. So you kind of did that in reverse. So how did yeah, you kind of... It was a honeymoon when we first opened. No, it wasn't at all, right? Because you're buying it and you're trying to get it back up versus like, hey, I've got this brand new studio. I'm going to ride it up. There's no COVID. Um, and, and people are very proud of that. So kind of coming in, one, you saved it, right? So you feel like, hey, I've saved this. But how did you kind of calibrate for yourself? Like, am I making progress? Um, was this a good decision? You know, entrepreneurs are always kind of on an island. 
and you don't really want to expose too much of like, oh, maybe this is a bad day. I always say, you know, I win one day and I'll lose the next day. Or, you know, I got four and three wins on every day. And I focus on the losses instead of enjoying the wins. So how did you kind of go into this and say, okay, I'm not going to go seven and oh this week. Not going to happen. Right. So how did you kind of say to yourself, we're going to get through this? Uh, there might not be progress this week, but nothing bad happened, you know, materially. So maybe talk a little bit about that on how you thought about it and where you are today. So our accountant advised us not to purchase the business. And we met with him yesterday and he was like, wow, it's doing really well now. Good job. Did you remind him? Oh, yeah. He, he knows. <laughs> um, but I think part of it, he does, it's a little, it's like a lifestyle business. I used to be a consultant for pharmaceutical companies and I could make a good living that way, but it didn't fulfill my meaning and purpose. And so that's really why my husband and I wanted to get me into yoga. And so there is a certain amount of like, okay, we're going to have to suffer through some tough times because this is ultimately where I want to be um, for the long term. Gotcha. And, you know, it, it took a while. I think something that really helped me is connecting with other studio owners. I had um, a studio owner from a Bikeland, a cycling group reach out to me, and it was really great to talk to somebody else who understood what I was going through. And she recommended BFS, the Boutique Fitness Solutions Group. And now I'm part of that group. And having that peer group and also getting advice from people, you know, who really know what they're doing. Because this is, this is a new field to me. Um, that has really helped me feel like, okay, I'm on the right track. I'm learning. Certainly we're making mistakes along the way. Um, but having those other peers in the industry has made a big difference. I think that is very unique about this industry that you might be have a competitor, but they're actually rooting for you and, and potentially sharing their financials and telling you exactly, you know, how they feel and how the business is doing without sugarcoating it and, and wanting to to the ecosystem to proliferate. Having this this peer group with with BFS, what are some of the things you've got out of it? Is it financial metrics? You know, what do you uh education? What, what else are you getting out of it? Um, yeah. So they have, you could almost think about it like a little support group, um, yeah. but we meet um, once a month and um, there are studio owners from all over the country and they make sure when they put the groups together that I'm never going to have a yoga studio owner in New York City. Right. You know, I worked with yoga studio owners in Ohio, um, in California, and there's a lot that we can share and learn from each other. Um, so you can bring your issues to that group. Like sometimes I've had situations and been like, hey, I don't know what to do here. And they'll be like, oh, this is our protocol X, Y, and Z, how we handle it, you know? So it's really helpful to get their input. Um, and they also do education and coaching with us as well. A lot about, you know, sales processes too and 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 following up on leads and all that. So they, they have a mix of, of offerings. Last question for you. You saved the studio. There's not a vacant uh, piece of real estate in this uh, apartment building. Your instructors are coming in. Your members probably are even more impressed with you than, than they probably say. And, and that, you know, that you've basically been the messiah for this, this location. How do you think about, do you need to open up another location? Do you need to license the brand? Do you need to have a five cluster? Or do you say, look, I'm good. You know, this works for me. Because uh, a lot of entrepreneurs get enamored with coming into us and saying, I've got three studios. I want to go to 100. Well, why? You know, what are you trying to gain? And what are you giving up to do that financially, lifestyle-wise, uh, stress, not spending time with your family, um, probably not sleeping as much, reporting to someone else instead of reporting to yourself. So at this point where you are, how do you think about that? Because there should be more focus on what the entrepreneur wants to do, not necessarily where the business needs to go. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's something that my husband and I discuss and debate. Um, Tangerine is a one-room studio. And so sometimes I do think that I would love to have a, a second location with two rooms, one room that's smaller where I could do more private yoga therapy. I could do more small group offerings. Because right now, if I want to do something that's more niche, I'm taking up the entire 
studio. And that doesn't really make sense financially. So that is the main reason why I would think about opening a second location. Um, but like a lot of New York City is very saturated already, in my opinion, you know, like, for example, Williamsburg, there are tons of yoga studios there. You know, do they need another hot yoga studio? Right, like, right. maybe not. But I mean, I, it's so, so it's something that I go back and forth on, certainly. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, a lot of health clubs, you know, build on top of each other and thinking that the demographic has enough uh, population to fill two, stu- two locations or they think that they're going to take market share uh, when they should just go to the next town over um, and provide this experience for more people. Uh, used to be Gold's Gym uh, would basically go as close as they could to a Bally's Fitness back in the day. Uh, but that was because Bally's didn't reinvest in the clubs. And they say, hey, we'll take all their members. We'll give them a better experience. Bally's is going to close at some point anyway. But do you make a really good point about is there a need or is there a location that warrants me moving tangerine, spreading yourself between two locations when you might just continue to build out more programming, you know, more of the, you know, specialized programs and basically take advantage of I have a space, it's in a great location, then maybe I can add hours and I could add programs inside and outside uh, the studio. So congrats on, uh, on getting to here. And, uh, you know, I think you methodically are, are thinking through the growth or just saying, hey, this is where I want to be. I don't need to be anywhere else. And I'm serving myself, the people around me, the instructors, and, you know, that means a lot. So good to see you again. And, uh, We've got to come take a class with uh, with Ganolin uh, at some point when we're back in the city. Yeah, we'd love to have you. Just let me know whenever. Awesome.